appreciate the good singing tonight. It's touched our hearts, prepared our hearts for the preaching of the Word of God. Take your Bibles and turn with me to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 14 tonight, please. The Gospel of Luke, chapter number 14. Bear with my voice tonight. It's in and it's out. Sometimes it may sound like AM and sometimes it may sound like FM. I don't know, but you pray for me. Now, don't forget, you go to the grocery store this week. Next Sunday night is Finger Foods after the service. You done forgot, have you? Oh, don't forget about that. Can you believe that Friday will be December the 1st? Hard to believe how fast. Time is going by, and the uh, the days that the Lord has given us to live for Him and serve Him are literally just flying by at a rapid speed. We need to be doing all we can for Him while we can, while He gives us time. Now, I hope you found your place in the Gospel of Luke, chapter number 14. And if you have, I want to draw your attention down to verse number 25. I want to begin reading in verse number 25. And there went great multitudes with him, and he turned and said unto them, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it, lest haply after he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it began to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to make war against another king sitteth not down first and consulteth whether he is able with ten thousand to meet him that cometh against him with twenty thousand. Or else, while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassage and desireth conditions of peace. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Now in this passage of scripture that I, that I read to you tonight, we find that no less than three times the Lord gives a condition for discipleship. Now he does not give condition for being saved. He's giving condition for discipleship. Now, in this passage of Scripture that I read, we find two parables given. And uh, they're given by the Lord to this great multitude that has gathered with Him, according to verse 25. And these two parables are about two expectations that the Lord has for His people. The Lord is not slack in fulfilling these two purposes for himself. And he certainly expects us to fulfill these two purposes in our Christian life. The first parable in verses 28 to 30 is a parable about building. And in verses 31 to 33, 
we find a parable about battling. So tonight I want to talk about these two parables, if you will, of building and battling. The Lord expects us to excel at both of these things. In these parables, He tells us so. Now there's not going to be any Christians who will escape the purpose of God's life for us in our building and in our battling. It's not a matter of preaching a message about whether we will build or whether we will battle, but the preaching tonight is designed to help us understand that Jesus expects us to build and Jesus expects us to battle. And He wants us to excel at both of them. So with the Lord's help tonight, I want to preach on the parables of building and battling. Let's pray together. Father, in Jesus' name, we want to thank You and praise You for Your precious Word again, letting us open it. Lord, thank You for letting us open it in peace without the threat of attack or the threat of arrest or the threat of assault. But Lord, we can stand here freely and uh, open up Your Word and read it with a glad heart. And Dear Lord, learn from what You have to say to us. Help us, Lord, to never again take for granted our salvation and our Christian life. But may we always be building. And dear Lord, may we always be found faithful in battling. And our Father, we just pray that tonight You'll speak to our hearts. And I pray that some child of God may get some help tonight from what is said from this passage of Scripture. Heavenly Father, I ask that your Spirit will fill and anoint me, give me breath and give me voice, to preach this word tonight. We ask in Jesus' name and for his sake, amen and amen. Now in, the, in this parable, uh, this first parable that has to do with building, the parable is not about counting the cost of salvation. Uh, this parable here uh, in verses 28 to 30 it is not a parable about how uh, to uh, become a child of God, but it tells us to consider the cost of being a child of God. It's not about considering the cost. Uh, Jesus paid it all, all to Him I owe. For God so loved the world <coughs> that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus paid the cost of our salvation. But rather this first parable is about building a Christian life and a Christian testimony for the glory of God. You know the Christian life tonight really for all of us is, is living out Christ's life through us as we yield ourselves to Him. That's really what the Christian life is all about. Yielding ourselves to Christ and letting Him live out His will through us. As I said this morning, I say again tonight, Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. We fight, uh, we fight these battles uh, in our Christian life as we are building our Christian life and our Christian testimony. So the first parable tonight is all about building. And uh, the second parable tonight is about battling. When we see that a king here is not counting a cost of what a war against the enemy will be, but what he's doing is rather than counting a cost, he's consulting and he's comp uh, he's considering. Hey man, that's another good C word. Contemplating. Thank you, Lord. He's contemplating uh, what this battle against a superior enemy is going to be like, and is he going to be able to see it through? Is his army 
that's outnumbered two to one going to be able to stand against an overwhelming enemy. And so this second parable is not about building, but it is about battling. And the Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12, Paul said, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And so we understand who our enemy is. We understand what the battle is as a child of God. Now the Bible tells us that we have been given uh, some weapons of our warfare. And the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 10 and verse number 4 uh, that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. We don't get our weapons from Smith and Wesson. We get our weapons from the Lord and from the Word of God. Did you know that the Lord Jesus Christ, He built and He battled. He was no different and He expects us to build and He expects us to battle. In the Gospel of Matthew chapter number 16 and in verse number 18, we find the Lord Jesus Christ building and we find the Lord Jesus Christ battling. You know, there in Matthew 16, Jesus asked those apostles, He said, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they responded and said, Some, well, some say you're Isaiah, Isaiah. Some say you're Jeremiah, uh, one of the prophets. Jesus said, All right, that's fine. But who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed this to you, but my Father which is in heaven. And then in verse 18, Jesus said, And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock, what's the rock? The rock of his Messiahship, the rock that he is the Son of God, the rock that he is God in flesh, the rock of the one who was going to pay the price for sin. He said, Upon this rock I will build my church. He's building He's building him a church, amen. 2,000 years he's been building him a church. And boy, when that family gets complete, he's coming back to get us and take us home to be with him. But he's not only building, but he's battling. For he said, not only will I build my church, he said, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And so he's building and he's battling. We're building and we're battling. I want you to know that even in the Old Testament, in the book of Nehemiah, we find Nehemiah, you remember his job? He was to rebuild the walls around Jerusalem. And we look back in the Old Testament in his life, and we see that those people, they were a building and they were a battling. Notice with me, if you will, if you want to turn with me. If you don't, you can just listen. But in Nehemiah chapter number 4 and in verse number 17, talking about building the walls around Jerusalem. And the Bible says, They which build it on the wall, and they that bear burdens with those that laden, every one of his, uh, every one with one hand wrought in the work, and the other hand held a weapon. They were building, and they were battling. And my friend, you and I are trying to build a testimony. God is looking for some people today to follow Him. He's looking for some people today to serve Him. He's looking for some people today who's able to help build His church and build His kingdom. And He's looking for some people that's got some backbone, amen, and that's got, some, got something about them that'll not only get them in the fight, praise God, but will keep them in the fight. Now, I want you to look in our text tonight, and we got a choir practice. Is that right? All right. So I'll, I'll try not to preach too awful long. But I, I want you to notice tonight uh, who the Lord is looking for in these areas of building and these areas of battling. I want you to notice, first of all, in verse number 26, uh, the Bible tells us, If any man come to me, and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be 
my disciple. I want you to notice in that verse of Scripture that Jesus is looking for people, number one, who will love Him supremely. Who will love Him supremely. Who will not make God a part of their life, but will who, make, who will make God their life. There's a big difference, my friend, in making Him a part of your life and making Him your life. He uses some pretty strong language here in verse number 26. We see Him say that if any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters and yea, his own life also. Is Jesus, is He telling us to hate? No, He's not telling us to hate. That word hate means to love less. That word means to love less. If you don't, if you love your father and your mother and your wife and your children and your brethren and your sisters and yea, even your own life, if you love those things more than you love Jesus, he didn't say you couldn't be saved. He said you can't be my disciple. You cannot follow after me. You cannot go where I need you to go. You're going to be ineffective. You're going to be on the shelf if these things have preeminence over God. And so the Lord's looking for people that will love Him supremely. You say, well, how, how do you know? How do you know when you've got somebody that loves God supremely? How do I know, preacher? How do I know that I love Him supremely like I should? Well, the Bible tells us in John 14, 15, uh, the Lord Jesus said that ones that love Him supremely will keep His commandments. They'll obey His word. He said in John 14, 15, If you love me, keep my commandments. That's the smallest little word, if, but it's got the biggest meaning. If you love me. That's conditional. In other words, there's a proof to the statement that you're making. I love Jesus. Well, if you love Jesus, then obey His word and keep His commandments and be faithful to His word. And don't just read it for recreation, but read it to learn by and, and read it to absorb and, and put it down in your soul. The psalmist said, Thy word, O Lord, have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. He's looking for people who will love him supremely. Those that will keep his commandments are people that love him. How about this? People who are willing to give their life for Jesus Christ. I'm not talking about just coming to an altar and being saved. I'm talking about giving your life over to Him and say, here I am. And Lord, you use me ever how you want to use me. Now I'll tell you something, that takes some, that takes some faith. That takes some courage. Uh, boy, that, that takes some, uh, some gumption to step out and get on your face before Almighty God and say, Lord, here I am. I yield myself to you. And Lord, I give myself to you for you to use me in ever, whatever capacity you want me to do. Have you done that? Have you, have you gave your life to Christ? Jesus said in John 15, 13, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life. For his friends. You know something? A pastor lays down his life for his church. Amen? A pastor lays down his life for his church. There are many other things that a man, a pastor can do, but he forsakes those things from time to time in order for the good of the church. The Lord Jesus gave his life literally. Jesus isn't asking any of us to go to a cross and be nailed to it. He's not asking us to wear a crown of thorns. He's not asking us to come under the beating of a scourge. But He is asking us to forsake our will for His will and be willing to go on. Now let me say that people that love Christ will obey His commandments. People that love Christ will give their life for Him and let Him use them. But let me tell you something else. 
another real true test of whether one loves the Lord supremely is they won't quit when suffering begins. They won't quit when the suffering begins. Could I read a little portion of scripture from 2 Corinthians 11? The Apostle Paul tells the church at Corinth some of the things that he has endured for the sake of the gospel. He said of the Jews five times, this is 2 Corinthians 11 beginning in verse 24, of the Jews five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Besides those things, that are without that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Paul said that there was suffering will come when we give our life to the Lord. He's going to ask us to do that. And he told Timothy that, Yea, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But I want you to know something. When Paul was getting ready to leave Ephesus, and go to Jerusalem. He talked about how that he didn't know what was waiting for him there. All he knew was the Holy Spirit had revealed to him that there was going to be trouble, that there was going to be those that were going to be after him. My friend, you would not be surprised to hear him say, well, I think I'm going to just uh, find me something else to do. I've been beat on enough, spit on enough, stoned enough, thrown in the prison enough, been in enough shipwrecks, been bitten by snakes, all that for the gospel. Why, I'm just going to find me something a little safer to do. And you might not be surprised to hear that. But my friend, let me tell you what Paul told them people at Ephesus in Acts chapter 20 and verse 24. He said, but none of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy. And the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And Paul said, here's what holds it all together. He said, here's the glue that holds everything together. Looking for people who will love Him supremely. People who will obey Him. People who will give themselves for Him. People who will endure the suffering and the persecution of being a Christian. He said in 2 Corinthians 5, 14, for the love of that's the glue constraineth us. Because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. The love of Christ is what keeps us going on. And that's what the Lord is looking for tonight in people. is people that will love Him supremely. I want you to notice secondly tonight, in, in Luke, back in Luke chapter 14, and I want you to look at verse number 27. He says, And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. He's not only looking for people to love him supremely, but he's looking for people who are willing to take up their cross and follow him. Take up their cross and follow him. You know, there was one consistent back in the Roman days, back when Jesus was crucified, there was one consistent, one constant about crucifixion. And that was this. That a man who had a cross placed on his back and he was under a sentence of death, when he went out to the place of execution, he was going out to end his life. He wasn't going out for revival. He wasn't going out to be refreshed. He wasn't going out to be restored. When a man took up his cross on his back and was heading out to the place of execution, he was going to die. 
He was going with no intention of ever coming back again. And I want you to think about that in our life for Christ as He has urged us and commanded us to take up our cross. He didn't say that if a man takes up his cross, he'll be saved. He said if a man takes up his cross, he can be my disciple. If a man don't take up his cross, he cannot be my disciple. He didn't say he couldn't be saved, but he said he couldn't be his disciple. And my friend, let me tell you something. A man who has taken up the cross is a man who's looking in one direction. That man wasn't looking back at his past life. He wasn't looking back and seeing who he was leaving. That man that had a cross on his back was heading to one place. He was heading to that place of execution. And a crucified man only looks in one direction. He's only got one thing on his mind. That's serving the Lord with all that he's got. Giving everything he has to the Lord. Paul said in Philippians 3.13, he gave us this little bit of insight into our cross bearing. He said, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth to those things which are before, I press forward. I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. The Bible told us in the book of Hebrews and chapter number 12 to keep our eyes on Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, looking unto Him for our God, for our strength, for our instruction. He's our everything, praise the Lord. And, and boy, I tell you, I felt a little breeze come by tonight when we was up there singing how that we're redeemed and how that Jesus buried my past. Hallelujah to God. Oh, listen, all by the blood of Jesus that the ladies were singing about tonight, a crucified man's looking in one direction. He's looking at the Lord Jesus Christ. He's keeping his eyes on him. And boy, like the old songwriter wrote, when you said, turn your eyes upon Jesus and the things of this world will just grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and his grace. A crucified man looks in one direction. Let me tell you something else about a crucified man. A crucified man also has nothing to hold on to. He has nothing at all to hold on to. Now the Bible tells us in this same text over in Philippians chapter 3 that I read a while ago in verses 7 and 8, Paul said, But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. Paul said, I don't have a thing in this world left. All I have is Jesus, but he's all that I need. Amen. He's all that we need. A crucified man has nothing to hold on to. You know, a crucified man has no further plans. He has no further plans. He's given all up for Jesus. You remember over in the Gospel of Luke, chapter number 9, I believe it is, I see it seemed like yes, beginning in verse 57, Jesus tells about three men he says over there in verse 57, And it came to pass that as they went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I'll follow thee wherever, wheresoever thou goest. The Lord, I'll just follow you anywhere. The Lord Jesus didn't say, That's great. Glad to have you. Appreciate you coming along. Jesus just looked at him and said, Foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head, and the next verse says, and he said unto another. What happened to that guy that said he'd go with Jesus anywhere? He's done hit the road when he found out it wasn't going to be easy. When he found out there's going to be some battling involved. When he found out that he wasn't going to live a nice, soft, cushy little life following the Lord. When the one he was following didn't even have a place to lay his head. <laughs> he said, I believe I picked the wrong one to follow. That man was not surrendered to the Lord. He was not taking up his cross. Jesus said to another, follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. Jesus said unto him, let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. You mean the Lord was so hard hearted he wouldn't let that man go bury his father? No, the problem was his daddy wasn't dead. He said, I just want to go do what I want to do 
And then when my obligations are over and my parents are dead and gone and I don't have to look after the things and don't have to look after the home, well, then I'll, I'll follow you then. No, Lord said, I ain't got time for that. You go and preach the kingdom of God. You go right now. That man, man had other plans, you see. Then he said to another, uh, he said, Lord, I'll follow thee, but let me first go and bid them farewell which are at my house. <laughs> right there, right there is the two deadliest words in all the word of God. Me first. Me first will ruin anything. Me first will ruin a marriage. Me first will ruin a friendship. Me first will destroy your fellowship with God. And the Lord said, no, you just go right ahead on. He said, the man I'm looking for that's willing to bear his cross is a man that has no further plans but to follow me. And then a crucified man, fourthly, is a man that's not coming back. He's not coming back. When Jesus went to Calvary, he had no plans of coming back down into Jerusalem to do any kind of business. He was going to the cross. He was going to die. And I want to tell you something. A man that's crucified and has given all to Jesus and loves Him and obeys Him and has taken up that cross has no plans of going back to the old life. Jesus said in Luke 9, 62, No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. That word fit means appropriate, ready. He's not appropriate. He's not fit for the kingdom of God. If he puts his hand to the plow and commits to follow Christ and then looks back at the world. William Whitting Borden was born on November the 1st, 1887 into a very wealthy family. His father had made his fortune in Colorado, silver mining. Young William was saved at the Chicago Avenue Church. You know it better today as the Moody Church in Chicago. Under the preaching of R.A. Torrey. Upon his graduation from high school, his mom and daddy gave him an around-the-world trip for his graduation present. It was on that trip God burdened young William's heart for missions. Upon his graduation from Yale University, William's intention was never to go into the family business for which he had been promised a spot and his portion of the great fortune of that family. But he chose rather to go to China to work among the who I the who we uh, Muslims in the Gansu province. But before he could go to China, he would have to go to Cairo, Egypt to learn Arabic so he could speak the language to them. When he was in Cairo, he contracted cerebral meningitis and was dead in three weeks, never reaching China. I want you to listen to me. When his mother received his Bible, she was reading through his Bible and she found three places where he had recorded a personal note in his Bible. The first words that she read were no reserve. And he wrote those words when he renounced his family fortune and surrendered to the Lord to go into missions. The next words she found written was no retreat. And he had written that when his father had sent word to him and said, you've wasted your life and you're never going to have a part of our family business. He wrote, no retreat. No reserve. And only assuming that this last entry was written just before his death, he wrote, no regrets died at the age of 25. Could have had his life on easy street, being the head of a multi-million dollar corporation. But he took up his cross and he followed the Lord. 
and said no reserve, no retreat, no regrets. And lastly tonight, back in our text in Luke chapter 14 and verse number 33, we find the third group of people that the Lord is looking for to follow Him. People who will love Him supremely. People who will take up their cross and follow Him. Lastly, verse 33 says, So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. The Lord's looking for people who are willing to forsake all for Him. Now, that word forsaketh there in verse 33 means to renounce. Just as William Borden had renounced his fortune, it means to renounce, to reject claim to three things. Write them down. We need to forsake for him our bodies. He said to us in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not of your own, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Surrender our bodies. Then he says that we should surrender our possessions not talking about emptying our bank account and bringing it all down here and put it in the church bank account. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about surrendering claim to and come to the realization that that money in the bank is not our money, that's God's money. That the automobile that we drive, that's not our vehicle, that's God's vehicle. The clothes we wear, <coughs> these are God's clothes. The air we breathe belongs to God. The food we eat belongs to God. It's not a matter of, of accepting that. It's a matter of acknowledging that. Forsaking all that we have. That I am thine, O Lord. Use me as you see fit. But not only do we forsake our bodies and forsake our possessions for the glory of God, but we are to forsake our will for His will. And Jesus Himself left us that example. In Luke 22, 42, Father, if Thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but Thine. Building and battling. Have you considered the cost of being a Christian? Have you considered your testimony? Have you given consideration to the enemy that we battle and the weapons that the Lord has given us? Prayer, the Word of God. Are we obeying Him? Are we loving Him supremely? Have we taken up our cross and are following Him with our eyes firmly focused on Him, no longer looking to the left or to the right, no longer looking behind us to see what we left behind, just looking for Him? Have you forsaken all that you have and acknowledge the fact that all that I have and all that I am is by the grace of the answer to those questions is no. There's a place for you on the altar tonight. If you're lost without Christ, <clears throat> I beseech you, I beg you to come and, and give your heart and your life to Him. Father, tonight in Jesus' name, we thank you for your precious word again. Thank you for this passage of Scripture about being your disciple. Lord, you've told us plainly what you're looking for and what you're expecting. And you've told us, Lord, that 
but that we meet those criteria of loving you supremely, taking up our cross, and forsaking all that we have. Those three times you said, if we don't do that, we cannot be your disciples. So Lord, tonight as I preach mainly to the church, pray you speak to hearts during this time of invitation. Have your will and way, we pray in Jesus' name. Always. Amen. Let's stand to our feet.